Hello kids, it's the Trailer Reader here with another episode of your 10 minute literary review. Today we'll be examining Charlotte Bronte's novel, Jane Eyre. Now, 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 don't give me that look. Sometimes reading classical literature is like eating your vegetables. You don't like to eat them, but you have to. Why? Because they're good for you. And what makes Jane Eyre so good for you to read? Why do you have to read this long and arduous 19th century romantic era novel? Because I said so. And it builds good character. And pretty much that's what this novel is all about. It's not just about making the right decisions. It's about being the right sort of person. So with that thought in mind, let's begin our 10-minute review of Jane Eyre. And now the novel basics. Jane Eyre was written in 1847 by Charlotte Bronte, one of two Bronte sisters. And between the two of us, my personal favorite. Sorry, Emily, I just can't stand Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff! Now, Jane Eyre is a Romantic Era novel which has some significance. But if you wanted to hear more about the Romantic Era, go check out my other video on The Scarlet Letter. Jane Eyre is a tale about a young orphan girl who gets taken in by her beloved uncle, who then promptly dies, and leaves her to her adopted family who proceeds to mistreat her in all kinds of ways. Then the tale goes on and she grows up and faces life situations that are so difficult and so melodramatic that it would make the serious telenovela jealous. Rochester, ¿ya estás casado? Sí, Jane Eyre, sí. Rochester, ¿por qué? What makes this such a beautiful story, though, is that through the fires of adversity, Jane Eyre comes out a stronger, more beautiful person than the one who entered it. Okay, so now that we've gone over the basics, let's discuss the plot and theme. As mentioned before, the novel begins with Jane being mistreated by her adopted family. Her aunt hates her, her three cousins mistreat her all the time, and we see a scene where she's off in the corner reading by herself, minding her own business, when her cousin, John, decides to come and bully her mercilessly. Well, poor little submissive, quiet Jane decided she's had enough, and she attacks him back. Not very much, but enough for us to send little John crying off to his mother like the little baby he is. Anyway, Jane's aunt decides she's had enough of this girl, and she just orders the maids to lock her in the red room, which is the room where Jane's uncle has died, and the poor little girl fears his ghost, and she's locked in her all night, no food. Uh, and she ends up coming out, and her aunt decides, you know what, I've had enough of this girl. I'm going to send her away to a boarding school, which at first Jane is so happy about. Oh, finally, I get away from these people. But then Mr. Brucklehurst, the minister in charge of the girls' school for the poor people, uh, comes over to the house, and her aunt maligns her character viciously, saying, oh, what a naughty and evil girl she is. You need to punish her as much as possible. And poor Jane's hope of escape is ruined. In a fitful rage, Jane decides to talk back to her aunt for the first time and give, delivers her such a scathing rebuke it leaves the aunt somewhat fearful of her mortal soul. You have not done your job as you promised to your dead husband, and you will be haunted. Now, at the school, Jane meets two people who change her life forever. One is Helen Burns. The second is Maria Temple. Now, Helen is a saintly girl about Jane's own age. Imagine the most perfect person you can possibly imagine is everything right, the sweetest disposition, and multiply that by ten, and you will have Helen. Now, unfortunately, because Mr. Brocklehurst is such a poor manager and, mis and does not treat the girls well and provide them with proper nutrition or clothing and that sort of thing, many of the girls get sick, including Helen, and she dies of cholera. This devastates Jane, and she decides, you know what, because Helen is with heaven, now with God, I'm going to live the best life I can. And from that moment on, she decides to do no more resentful slammings of relatives, but be the best person and take it on the other cheek like Helen would. The second person to really influence Jane is Maria Temple. Now, Maria Temple is the headmistress of the school for girls. And she actually does her best to go behind Mr. Brocklehurst's back to make sure the girls get what they need in terms of education and nurturing and care. Uh, this really inspires Jane to become a teacher herself. And that is, in fact, what she does. 
As she grows up and graduates, she decides to become a teacher back at the school that she was previously a student of and stays there until her dear friend, Miss Temple, gets married and moves out. So Jane is faced with an option. What am I going to do? Jane decides, you know what, I've had enough teaching in the school and she wants to do something different. So she takes on the job of being the governess of the ward of the mysterious and slightly wicked Mr. Rochester. Now, there are a lot of mysteries at this manor house, but one of the biggest is why did Rochester hire this stern and somewhat scary maid named Grace Poole? Why does she stay up in the attic all day? What are these woman screams I sometimes hear in the night? And who is the face of that woman that appeared above my bed while I was sleeping? Very good questions. And a very interesting answer. But before we get to the answers to those questions, Jane and Rochester fall madly in love. And they're a good match for each other. They're both very intelligent people with strong opinions. Uh, while Rochester is wicked, Jane is more saintly, and they seem to fit well together. But then... After Rochester proposes marriage and Jane happily accepts on the day of their wedding, while they're doing their wedding vows, if there's anyone who might object to this wedding, uh, I've got an objection. And what's your objection? Rochester's already married. Rochester, you're already married? Yes, Jane Eyre. Yes. Rochester, why? As it turns out, Rochester really is married, but it's a pretty pathetic and sad marriage, and is mostly a sham. Rochester takes the whole wedding party up to the attic where he then shows them, locked behind the door, guarded by Grace Poole, his very violent and very crazy wife. He explains how they met, how he was sort of tricked into the marriage, and how miserable his life has been ever since. He then takes Jane aside and says, listen, nobody knows who we are in Europe. We can go there and be husband and wife, because my, my my marriage is not a real marriage, obviously. I mean, look at this. You saw how she tried to hurt people and hurt herself. I, I can't really be bound by that, can I? And Jane faces the biggest temptation of her life. Do I set aside my morality and marry Rochester, or do I do what's right? Well, Jane does what's right, and she leaves the house that night. Thus begins the third leg of her journey. Now, Jane gets dropped off in the middle of nowhere by the coach because that's as much money she has to pay for it, and she wanders around the wilderness lost, starving, thirsty, and she finally gets taken in by a family of siblings. Now, it doesn't take long for these family siblings to recognize Jane's character and how great a person she is. They help her get a job as a teacher in the local community, and eventually... The eldest brother, St. John, recognizes her as an ideal mate, not because he loves her, but because he's a missionary going to India, and he needs a wife to support him in his ministry. And Jane is actually tempted. Why? Because she loves God. She loves doing God's work. But there is no love with this man. And so she has to make a really tough decision. Do I marry him or do I not marry him? Well... She doesn't marry him. In the middle of the night, she gets a dream of Rochester calling out to her, Jane, Jane, come to me, Jane. And she thinks that this is a sign from God to go find out what happened to him. So she packs all her things. She goes away and she discovers Rochester hidden away, not in his manor house, which is burned down to the ground, but in the little shack in the forest, scarred face, blind eyes, why? Because his wife went nuts, escaped, set fire to the whole house. And while she was trying to kill herself, he was trying to save her from the flames, but she pushed him away and leapt from the roof of the building. And the, everything collapsed, and Rochester barely made it out with his life. God has punished him for his sin of proposing marriage when he was already married. Fortunately, Rochester has repented of this sin, and Jane and Rochester still are very much in love, and they decide to get married. Now, Rochester is penniless, but that actually doesn't matter. Why? Because there was another rich uncle that Jane had that left everything to her when he died. Now, this message was severely delayed because of her wicked aunt. So, with all this, at the very end of the novel, Jane decides to pay a visit to her dying aunt. And on the bedside with her aunt, she forgives her for all the mistreatment that she's given to Jane. 
And it's a touching moment, sort of. Uh, the aunt doesn't really like Jane still, but she realizes the error of her ways. And she also repents of her mistreatment of Jane. Which leads us to one of the main themes of the novel, which is the importance of doing the right thing, especially when the wrong thing promises what your heart really wants. Okay, so now it's time to do some analysis, and I'm going to intersperse it this time with some of the reading tips. Tip 1. Remember the Romantics. This novel is sort of fairy tale-ish with a small scattering of preternatural events that gives the reader a sort of a sense of a divine observer overlooking everything and occasionally interceding on the characters on their behalf or against them, depending on the moral choices that they make. Sometimes nature itself sends signs and portents. One of the most notable of this is when Rochester proposes marriage to Jane underneath this one tree, this one beautiful tree. Well, that very night, lightning strikes the tree and splits it in two, signifying that their love is doomed. Tip number two, don't get lost in the details. There are many long descriptive passages and soliloquies and sermons that are in this book. And it's easy to forget the events that come before them and after them as you're going through it. So don't do that. Remember them. Because that will help you give insight into what the author Charlotte Bronte is trying to express through them. One of the most memorable of these types of passages is right after Rochester proposes that Jane and he leave for Europe and ignore the fact that he's already married. Now Jane goes into this long sermon to herself trying to convince herself of why doing the right thing is important, how morals are only good at moments like this, when the choice is tough. Otherwise, what good is having a sense of morality if you can just pick and choose when you decide to turn it on and turn it off? Anyway, it's actually much more elegantly put than I just put it, but it's an example of the types of things that you've got to pay attention to in this novel in order to get the point of the story. Tip number three. Research all the allusions and intertextual references. Look, guys, this book has tons of references to works outside the book, like literary tracts, Milton's poetry, the Bible, everything that your average 19th century reader would be very, very familiar with. Us, not so much. But she includes them in this work for a reason. So it's important that you actually look them up, research what it is they're about, and maybe what they mean and what she intends by it, so she can get a fuller understanding of the story. Well, that's it, kids. Did you enjoy your veggies? Uh-huh. Come on, be honest. You kind of like them. But if you didn't, at least I hope you found this video useful in analyzing Jane Eyre and maybe even added to your enjoyment of it. It's a long-winded novel, but you'll get through it. Trust me. It builds character. Now, below is listed a bunch of links to give you further insight into this novel should you need it. And if you ask me, I can actually answer some questions too. Also, if you'd like to recommend a book for a future episode for me to cover, please list it in the comments section below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe. Come on, kids. Keep reading. That's good for you. This is the Trailer Reader, signing out. Hey, babe. What did you think you took away from the book Jane Eyre? Well, you don't have to be beautiful to marry a rich man as long as wife is crazy. <laughs> I don't think that was the point.